morning, everyone. Um, as they said, my name is Kate Inhouse. I'm an assistant professor of educational psychology at the University of South Carolina. I'm very honored to receive the Pinterest Dissertation Award last year and excited to share my research with you all today. So, really appreciate you all being here um, this morning. Um, I will say, before I get started, I'm a little nervous about preparing a 50 minute talk because I normally train to speak for 15 minutes, 15 minutes only. So, the task of preparing a 50 minute talk was a little daunting. Um, so, if I get off track or rave on about something, um, you know, just let me know. Hopefully, we can keep things on track here today. Um, so, when I was thinking about what I wanted to do for my talk today, um, the title of my talk is Toward Holistic Understanding of ELL Children and Their Well Being. Um, so, what I really wanted to focus on was, of course, including my dissertation, but extending beyond that as well. Um, so, really focusing on getting a more comprehensive understanding of how young children are functioning in our classrooms and schools. So, a lot of times we see in the literature, also in the media, there's a big emphasis on academic achievement, standardized testing outcomes, uh, literacy skills, especially among this group of students. Those things are all very important, but a lot of people are missing from the picture is an understanding of how these children are functioning on a psychological and social emotional level in the classroom. So really, today, I wanted us to move beyond just the academic side of things and really get a more comprehensive and systemic idea of the experiences that ELL children are having in today's school. So that's where we're going to be headed today. Um, so our focal points for today, um, because I did receive this award for my dissertation, I thought it would be good if I talked about my dissertation today. So we're going to start off with that. Um, and again, because um, this is a 50 minute talk and I wasn't sure if I could talk for 50 minutes just about my dissertation, um, I'm going to include a follow up study as well and kind of share what I'm doing with my research now. Uh, so, the title of my dissertation is School Support, Rental Involvement, and Academic and Social Emotional Outcomes for English Language Learners. I'm really excited. Um, this study just came out in the American Educational Research Journal this month, um, the August issue. So after today, if you have further questions about the study, want more details, you can look at the August issue of ARJ and get more information there. Um, after that, um, like I said, I'm going to be moving into a follow-up study that I've been working on. So this follow-up study is a direct result of a question that arose from my dissertation research. Uh, so this can kind of show, you know, since two years um, finishing my dissertation, what, what I've been doing since then and where this line of research has led me currently. As the title of this study is Native Language Blackfoot and Academic Achievement and Social Emotional Wellbeing and Mediator. Um, so I'll be kind of finishing my talk with that. And this um, study is definitely still in the works. Um, the analyses are completed, but we're definitely still working on the manuscript. So today I'm just going to be presenting some preliminary findings and my initial thoughts on some of those findings. I'm happy to hear some of your all's ideas about sorting through um, some of the results of this study as well as we work on that. All right, um, so kind of looking at some background information that will really be for both of the studies that I'm going to talk about today. Um, first of all, ELL stands for English Language Learner. Um, I'll just be calling them ELLs for the talk today. You'll also see them called ELs or English Learners as well. Um, but English Language Learners are currently the fastest growing segment of our school age population in the U.S. So there are more than 5 million ELL children in U.S. schools, uh, which comprises more than 10 percent of the school age population right now. For me on a personal level, I've always been really interested in working with this population of students um, and doing research with them now because I've always lived in the southeastern U.S. Um, the southeastern states currently have the fastest growth rates um, in the country in ELL students. So when um, I was born and raised in Kentucky, did all my graduate work in Kentucky, and when I lived there working on my dissertation, I was looking at state-by-state -state data, and Kentucky had a 417% increase in ELLs between 1990 and 2005. So at the time, I was like, that's a huge increase, kind of a mind-boggling number. Then I moved to South Carolina and saw that South Carolina actually has a number one growth rate in the ELLs, which really surprised me. But during that same 15-year time period, they had over a 700% increase in ELLs in South Carolina public schools. So as you can imagine, um, especially locally, where um, I live and work, teachers and administrators are often unprepared for this influx of students and unsure about how to best instruct, educate, and support this group of students and their families. So that was really the focus of my dissertation study, was learning how schools can support ELL students and also their parents um, in the education process. Um, so we know that limited proficiency in English is definitely a risk factor for academic difficulties for students. That's been consistently demonstrated in the literature. We also see with ELL students 
that they um, oftentimes experience a variety of other stressful and environmental conditions. So this can include immigration, poverty, discrimination, cultural conflict between home and school, often separations from family members, a whole host of environmental stresses that can contribute uh, to negative academic and behavioral outcomes in the classroom. So the risk factor for academic failure and dropout as students get older and progress into high school, and also social emotional difficulties in school. So teachers report that PLLs have fewer adaptive skills, more learning problems, fewer interpersonal skills in the classroom, and ELL children themselves report um, more social and emotional difficulties as well when looking at child self-reported data. So we tend to see um, they tend to be at risk for some negative academic and behavioral outcomes. Um, looking at uh, sort of the developmental period for this group of students during the elementary school years, we know that elementary school was a critical time period for establishing foundational academic skills, so reading and literacy skills, numeracy skills. Um, it's also when students are establishing a more concrete sense of self-identity. Um, so these academic skills and, and you know, beginning this formation of self-identity, the elementary school years are really critical for establishing a positive developmental trajectory for children that's going to carry with them into middle and high school as well. In an elementary school, um, children spend the majority of their time in two places, which are school and home. So these are going to be the um, two environmental contexts where support is most needed for students. So the purpose of my dissertation study was to determine how support from the school environment and support from parents can contribute can contribute to positive academic and social emotional outcomes for ELL children during those foundational elementary school years. Um, the theoretical foundations for the study, um, the study was grounded in Bronfenbrenner's bioecological model. I'm sure that most of us are fairly familiar, at least somewhat familiar with this model, so I'm not going to go over that in detail, but just to highlight two components of the model that are applying to my study here. Um, I was focused on two of the subsystems in the model, so the microsystem level, um, which we know is the child's most immediate environment that surrounds them on a daily basis, um, which could be family, schools, peer groups. Um, for this study, I was focused on children's school environment as an important microsystem for them. Um, and at the mesosystem level, which is a link between two different microsystems, um, I was really focused on that connection between their home environment and their school environment, so the extent to which parents are involved in their education, involved in school, so really looking at that home school connection and the importance of that for ELL students. Looking a little more closely at schools as a microsystem for ELLs, uh, we know there is a wide variability of support services that are offered to ELL students. Just in terms of specialized language instruction, um, it runs all across the board. There's um, you know, English immersion, structured English immersion, transitional bilingual education, two-way bilingual immersion, and many other types of programs out there. Um, so you're going to see variability from school to school, district to district, and state by state. We know some states now have mandated English-only instruction, which is not supported by the literature, but that is a whole separate talk from what I'm doing today, so I'm not going to get into that. Um, but there's going to be a lot of variability in what students receive. We also see a big source of variability is the concentration of ELL students that are within the school. Um, the literature shows that ELLs tend to be a highly segregated group of students. So 70% of the nation's ELLs attend only 10% of the nation's schools. So again, these high ELL schools where more than 25% of the student body is comprised of ELL children tend to offer much more support services because they have more students who are in need of these services. So they offer more specialized language programs, more academic support pro programs, and also more Title I services, and more family outreach services to families as well. So lower ELL schools um, you know, tend not to offer as many supportive services because they may not have resources or time um, in order to justify those expenses and provide those types of programs for students. We also see in um, the past decade or so, a couple of national studies have been done to kind of detail the current state of ELL education. These have been descriptive studies. Um, they've identified several areas of concern. Um, so one, more and more ELL children are receiving no type of specialized support programs at school at all. The students who are receiving some type of support program are most often being taught in English only. And teachers receive very little training um, and instruction in working with this group of students. So 
we see some areas of concern here, but what we don't know is how these support services or lack thereof are actually linked to student outcomes. We kind of know what's being offered to students, what's going on in the schools, but we don't really know how that connects to student outcomes, um, and outcomes at the actual student level. So that was really the focus of my dissertation study was to get some data linking services and academic behavior outcomes together. Looking at the homeschool message system, um, we all know that parental involvement is important. That's been consistently demonstrated in the literature as well. We tend to think of parental involvement as being important for academic outcomes, which it definitely is. Um, but what we're seeing in recent years in the literature as well is that it's also really important for social emotional well-being for students, which makes sense if you think about um, the extent that parents and teachers are communicating. They're often communicating just as often or perhaps more frequently about social, behavioral, emotional issues in the classroom as they are about academic tasks. So to the extent that parents and teachers can work together to address social, emotional, and or behavioral issues at home and at school, students are going to have more positive social and emotional outcomes um, as a result of that communication. Um, so we know for a lot of support for both academic and social emotional development for students. Um, we also see with ELL families, they can often experience a variety of barriers that may prevent them um, from being active participants in their children's education. So one, um, obviously there can be a language barrier. Many parents and families of ELL children do not speak English. Um, so that can be really difficult to communicate with teachers, to understand and fill out paperwork that's sent from the school, to help their children with homework in the evenings. All those things can be a real challenge for ELL families. Uh, we also see logistical issues, so childcare, transportation, uh, work schedules that can make it difficult to be more involved in um, children's education. And then one thing probably most important to, to mention is the way that ELL families are often viewed by teachers in schools. So oftentimes we see, um, you know, for families who are uninvolved, teachers or schools may view them as uncaring or they don't value their children's education, which in fact we typically see the opposite in the literature for ELL families. We see that they have high educational aspirations for their children and they do place a high value on education for their students. Uh, so unfortunately, schools often are not able to find an effective way to reach out to these families and engage them in an effective, in an effective manner to be a partner with them in their children's education. So what I really wanted to know in my dissertation is if schools can provide more support services to ELL parents and families, does that increase parental involvement and ultimately contribute to more positive outcomes for ELL students as well? Important student outcomes I wanted to address here, as I said earlier, the majority of research with ELL students has focused more on the academic achievement realm. And that's definitely important, and that's addressed in my dissertation study as well. Um, but again, like I said earlier, I wanted to kind of broaden that view a little bit. Um, and we know two other areas, well, among others, that are important to students' educational success are their self beliefs, for example, academic self concept, and their social emotional well being. So I wanted to include both of those variables as important student outcomes and to look at how they relate to ELL's academic achievement as well. So my research questions, um, number one is a higher level of school support for ELL students and families associated with more positive academic and social emotional outcomes at the student level. Two is the relationship between school support and ELL student outcomes mediated by parental school involvement. And three, how do ELL children's perceived academic and social emotional skills relate to, our, relate to their actual levels of achievement in the classroom? So the participants uh, were drawn from the Early Childhood Longitudinal Study Kindergarten Cohort of 1998. Really long name, I'll just be calling it ECLSK, um, so that'll be a little easier to pronounce. Um, but there were approximately 1,020 third grade ELLs who were included in the study. I didn't use the restricted use data files because I was looking at support services and small samples of students, and those um, data were restricted. 87% um, of the students were Spanish speaking Hispanic ELLs, 50% female, and 97% attended public schools. Um, to identify language status, and this was identified at kindergarten entry, um, students who had a non English home language were administered the oral language development scale, which is the OLDS. And if they scored below the cut point of 37 points on this instrument, they were identified as having limited proficiency in English and were included as ELLs in my dissertation study. The measures that I used, um, I used parent interviews to measure parental school involvement. 
these teacher surveys to measure um, actual um, if students were receiving the types of services that were typically provided to EL students in the classroom and also teachers level of training and experience in working with EL students. We use school administrator surveys um, to measure the outreach services that were provided to EL families by the schools and also to get a measure of school level control variables that needed to be included in the study, for example, school size, the percentage of ELL students at the school, etc. Um, and for direct child assessment, to measure academic achievement, we used reading and mathematics IRT scores, and these were from direct cognitive assessments that were administered by the ECLSK researchers to all participants um, in the ECLSK study. And we used the adaptive self-description questionnaire one to measure academic self-concept and also social-emotional problems by a child self-report. The data analyses, um, we used in-plus statistical software, because we had missing data for students, parents, teachers, and school administrators, um, we ended up using multiple imputations to impute 10 data sets to make sure that our analyses were not biased by the varying levels of missing data we had across the performance. Um, we used the appropriate sampling weight um, for the ECLSK data and the type, equal, type equals complex analysis setting. So using the complex analysis setting accounts for the nested structure of the ECLSK data, so students are nested within classrooms and within schools. Uh, the complex analysis setting adjusts the standard errors in the model to account for the non-independence of observation. So that was important to use as well. Um, we used structural equation modeling, or SEM, to build a hybrid model, which essentially means we started with the measurement model to make sure we were measuring the latent constructs well, um, they were a good fit to the data, and conceptually made sense. And then we added in regression paths um, to test direct effects in the model to build a full structural model. Um, to test mediation paths, we used the ProcLin program. Um, the ProcLin program um, adjusts for the fact that the mediation pathway to the indirect effect is the product of two different paths that have a non normal distribution. So it competes a 95% asymmetric confidence interval, accounting for the non normal distribution of the indirect effect. So here's the structural model um, that I tested here, and you'll see all of the control variables are not included in the image because you wouldn't be able to read that otherwise. So I've just listed them on the side here. But you'll see school support and parental involvement um, on the left side there, and then the three student outcomes, academic achievement, academic self-concept, and social emotional problems are listed on the right hand side. There are direct paths from school support to parental involvement and the three student outcome variables. Also, direct paths from parental involvement to the three student outcome variables. And then finally, um, we looked at correlational paths among the three student outcomes as well to see how they were interrelated. For the school level control variables, we control for school types, so whether it's a public or private school, uh, the school enrollment size, if the school is designated as a Title I school, the percentage of ethnic minority students in the school, and the percentage of ELL students in the school. Um, for student controls, um, Hispanic ELL served as a reference group because they were the majority of the sample. We created dummy codes for Asian Pacific Islander um, racial background students and also students from other racial and ethnic backgrounds. We controlled for socioeconomic status, students' grade level in school, their previous mathematics and reading achievement in first grade, and finally, child ESL measured the extent to which the child actually was receiving language support in the third grade. Um, and then the model fits, you can see the RMSK was 0 0.02, CFI was 0 0.943, so it fell within the acceptable range uh, for the model fit indices. So important findings, um, there were lots of different findings that came out of this. I'm kind of getting some of the highlights here today. Um, so higher levels of school support for ELL students and families um, predicted more parental involvement among ELL families. So parents were significantly even more involved when schools offered more support services to students and families. More parental involvement was linked with fewer social and emotional concerns for ELL students. And ELL children with fewer social and emotional concerns had significantly higher levels of academic achievement in the classroom. And finally, looking at that relationship between academic self-concept and achievement, when we looked at global measures of self-concept and achievement, we did not see any significant relationships there. But when digging into more domain-specific measures, so reading self-concept and reading achievement, mathematics self-concept and mathematics achievement, we did see significant 
significant length there. So that's very consistent with the literature highlighting the importance of considering domain-specific measures of self-police and achievement rather than just um, analyzing those local constructs. So those um, tend to, tend, tendencies in the literature apply to our ELL students as well. Um, so the findings I just talked about were the um, you know, positive expected findings you hope to get out of the study when you first get started. Uh, we also had some unexpected findings that were opposite of what we expected, which is always great when that happens. Um, so I'm going to talk about those as well, because those are equally important to uh, sort through when that happens in your research, and that happens. Um, so what we found is um, the direct paths from school support to academic achievement were negative and the direct path from school support to social-emotional problems was positive, indicating that students reported um, more social-emotional problems and had lower academic achievement when they attended schools that provided more support services. Again, this was not what I was hoping to find. It was the opposite of what I was expecting. But I think there's really a variety of factors that um, are contributing or explaining these results, and so I'm going to go through those to kind of help sort some of this out because I think that that's really important to the study and also future research in this area in terms of um, methodological design and how we can ensure that that's as valid as possible. Um, so I think the biggest thing to consider here is that um, support, like I talked about earlier, schools that offer more support services to students are the schools that have higher percentages of ELL students, higher percentages of ethnic minority students, higher percentages of high poverty students. These school characteristics are school characteristics that are also linked with lower achievement at the school level. So it becomes really difficult to disentangle support services from school characteristics that are associated with lower achievement. Um, there's been some other studies um, you know, looking at preschool support programs that have noted similar difficulties in disentangling these issues. Um, so it, it tends to be you know, a problem um, when looking at services and student outcomes. Um, so I think there's some possible confounding factors at the school level that could be contributing to these results. I attempted to control for as many of those as I possibly could in my model, and I thought that I had gotten um, you know, the, the big ones that would be contributing. But one thing that pops into my mind that I think um, might be involved here is the quality of teaching at the school. So oftentimes, again, with schools that have more ELL students, more high poverty students, we see that there's higher teacher turnover rates at the school, higher teacher to student ratios, um, more new teachers or you know, lower qualified teachers teaching in the schools. So those things may be associated with lower quality teaching for students attending these schools. I do not have data to tap into quality of teaching, uh, but I think that's definitely something that could be involved in and is, is important to consider here. Also, the measurement of school support in the study. Again, using the secondary data set, um, where I didn't get to go out and collect all of my own data, which probably would have been helpful, um, but the way that school support was measured was more of a quantity measure. So does this school provide this type of service to students, yes or no? Does the school offer this type of you know, service to parents of ELL families? Yes or no? So we basically ended up with a tally of a variety of services that are offered. We didn't have any data regarding the quality of these services, which again is going to be really important, especially when thinking about specialized language instruction and all the different formats of that that are provided to students. We didn't know, um, you know the extent to which the students' native language was used um, in support programming. Was the goal of the language support to just gain English skills as fast as possible, or was it to maintain bilingualism for students? That's a huge factor to consider. Um, so we just didn't have that quality measure to tap into here, which I think could be an issue as well, and something to improve upon for future research. And finally, the cross-sectional design of the study. This was a snapshot of students during their third grade year. Uh, we've seen in some previous research that um, support services for ELL families and students can be linked with gains over time in academic skills for ELLs. Um, but again, using this cross-sectional design in third grade, it may provide a restricted view of some of the potential long-term benefits of these types of programs for ELL students. So I think that's the time frame study is important to know as well. So implications in future research, um, given the um, importance of parental involvement to positive social emotional well-being among ELL students, I think it's really important for schools to find effective ways to engage ELL families. And 
and to do a, a better job of that. We tend to see that EL families are not as involved in school um, as um, families of English first language families. Um, so, you know, this study provided tangible strategies that schools can use to do that. So, providing interpreters at parent teacher conferences, at all school events, open houses, you know, anything that's offered at the school, having interpreters there. Um, also, making sure that all communication sent home from schools, so newsletters, emails, paperwork, whatever that might be, that it's uh, translated into the family's native language. And also offering, um, you know, orientations and special meetings for ELL families throughout the year. So those are the particular variables that were included in this study, and again, tangible strategies that schools can use to foster higher parental involvement. We also saw, given the link between social emotional concerns and academic achievement for ELL students, um, how important their social emotional well being is in the classroom. Um, so, I think for future research, and as a, I'm going to talk about this like right after this, so I'll kind of keep you guys on the edge of your seat here. Um, but looking at social emotional concerns as a possible mediating variable in the relationship between language status and achievement. So, really asking, you know, are ELL students experiencing more social emotional concerns, and that's contributing to some of the achievement differences that we see between ELL students and their English proficient peers. So again, I'm going to be talking about that with my follow-up study, um, and then looking at possible prevention and intervention strategies focused on social emotional being and mental health, especially for this population of students, which I'll also talk about um, a little more in a second here. Um, so that's it for my dissertation. I'm going to be moving into my follow-up study now. Um, if you guys have questions throughout, feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'll hopefully have a little bit of time for questions at the end. Yeah. Before you continue, Yes, great question, great question. Thank you. And that will apply to the next study as well. So um, she was asking how it measured social emotional skills. Um, so in both studies, it was measured by internalizing problems, externalizing problems, and peer relationships um, for ELL students. Yes, and that will be in this um, forthcoming study as well. Mm -hmm. And that was child self report as well. Yes. Yes, that there were a lot of different variables. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to remember listing all of them. But this particular, um, in this study, I looked at parental involvement at school. So it was the extent to which um, parents were communicating with teachers, attending parent-teacher conferences, um, going to different events at the school. So it was more, um, not as much about parental involvement in the home, which I think is very important and a good avenue for future research, but more specifically at school um, and communicating with teachers as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. So going off of that, was it uh, teachers' reports of parental involvement? It was parents' reports. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, parent report of involvement. Any other questions I can use in there? All right. Well, again, I'll leave some time at the end, hopefully, as well. Um, so um, moving on to the follow up study that I've been working on and kind of where I am in the slide of research right now. Um, so, native language background and academic achievement and socio emotional well being a mediator. Um, so, that's kind of what I'm going to finish my talk with here today. Just to get a little more background information related to this particular study, um, and I'm not going to go over all the things I talked about earlier, um, but we do have some growing evidence indicating that ELL students tend to report more social emotional concerns at school as compared to their English proficient peers, their EP peers, as you'll see it on some of the later slides here. So there's a study that I did a couple of years ago um, that found that Spanish-speaking ELLs report significantly more internalizing and externalizing difficulties as compared to their English proficient peers, uh, which makes sense if you're thinking about that. Just um, the process of learning a, a new language um, in itself can contribute to anxiety, worry, difficulty paying attention, difficulty following directions in the classroom. Um, so it's not surprising when you think about a lot of the experiences that they're having in the classroom trying to learn English, maybe adjust to a new culture, that type of thing. Um, and then we also see um, in, in a study that I worked on that Asian language ELs reported more difficulties with peer relationships as compared to English proficient classmates. Um, so there were some differences between ELL groups that we saw for both groups. They're reporting at least some level of um, increased social and emotional concerns in the classroom. And we do know from the research, research consistently shows that social emotional concerns 
are linked with um, lower academic performance among the general school age population, and then also among ELL specifically, which we just talked about in the dissertation study. To date, however, no research has examined the um, potential role of social emotional well-being as a mediating variable in this relationship between language status and achievement. So what we're really talking about here is looking at this relationship between language status and achievement. So whether students are ELL or EP and their academic performance in school, there are a multitude of factors that are going to be involved in those achievement differences that we tend to see. We tend to see across the board ELLs do have lower academic achievement um, than English proficient students. And again, there could be a variety of factors that are contributing here. So um, poverty, ELL students tend to experience higher poverty rates that English proficient students do. Um, language fluency is definitely an issue. Um, different cultural um, immigration issues that might be involved. There's a whole host of factors that we need to consider there. But what I'm wondering here is if social emotional well-being is one piece of that puzzle um, that could partially be contributing to achievement differences between the two groups. And really, if we can pinpoint that as um, you know, one piece of this puzzle that, that is um, contributing to achievement differences, this really has implications for policy and practice because a lot of student variables, um, you know, things involved in students' home lives, um, their socioeconomic status, we can't change those things. Uh, but socio-emotional well-being is a malleable variable, which means schools can work to promote social emotional well-being and psychological health among students. So I think that's a really important finding um, for both research and then practice moving forward in this area. Um, also, in looking at this relationship between language status and achievement and, and also social emotional well-being, there's two major sources of variability we want to consider here. So one is the informant. Um, who's reporting on social emotional well-being? Is it students that are self-reporting or is it teacher reports? And this is important because we tend to see in the literature there are differences between what teachers are perceiving and what students are perceiving. Um, and just as an example of um, the few studies in this area that have been done with ELL children, there was a study a couple of years ago that showed I'm using teacher reported data, uh, which showed that the majority of ELL students had better social emotional well being than their English proficient counterparts. Whereas the study that I just talked about using child self reported data. Um, showed that ELL children reported you know, lower social emotional well-being than their English proficient classmates. So we get some different findings there when we look at who's doing the reporting. So that's something that I wanted to address in the study and include both teacher and child self-reports. And then two um, is native language background. Unfortunately, um, with ELL students, a lot of times in um, research, we end up working with small sample sizes um, where ELL students are all lumped together as one group. Uh, which is unfortunate because we know that there are an extremely diverse and heterogeneous group of students. So just in the United States, ELL speak over 460 different native languages. So the diversity among this group of students is, you know, really huge. Um, but like I said, in the literature and also just in national educational, educational databases that are maintained, they're often lumped together as one group of students. Um, but to the extent that we can, um, it's, it's you know, really important to look at within group variability among this group of students. And that does require having large enough sample sizes to get large enough groups that you can use in your statistical analyses and still have enough power um, to conduct your statistical analyses. So for this particular study, I would have liked to have, again, um, larger groups of students from other native language backgrounds to include. Um, but what I ended up doing is um, the two largest groups of ELL students in U.S. schools are Spanish-speaking ELLs and students from Asian language backgrounds. So I did um, separate out these two groups of ELL students to at least get some measure of within group variability using the two largest groups that we have in U.S. schools. Um, and again, I'll talk more in future research about how we need to improve and look at further within group variability as well. So the purpose of this study was to determine the extent to which social emotional well-being mediated the relationship between language status and achievement, exploring potential differences in this relationship based on informant um, and also students' particular native language background. So participants um, were also drawn from the ECLSK, um, which I talked about earlier. For this study, I used data from the third and fifth grade rounds of data collection, so these students were slightly older. Um, students were identified as ELL or EP based on the primary home language that was listed in their school records. So we're 6,981 English proficient students 
829 Spanish-speaking ELLs and 378 ELLs from Asian language backgrounds. Um, and ELLs that spoke a language background other than an Asian language background or Spanish were excluded from the study simply because I didn't have large enough numbers to, to be able to include them in my statistical analyses. For the measures, um, again, for academic achievement, we used IRT scale score and the median map, which I talked about earlier. Um, for child self-reported social emotional well-being, we used the self-description questionnaire. And for teacher reported social emotional well-being, we used the social writing scale. And for both of these measures, child report and teacher report, um, like the question I answered earlier, it was measured by internalizing problems, externalizing problems, and peer relations for teacher and child report. The data analysis, again, we used M plus. Um, we used weighted least squares estimation with means and variances, which accounts for categorical data in your analyses. Again, use the complex analysis setting to account for this uh, nested nature of the data. And we use the appropriate sampling weight uh, when you're using third and fifth grade rounds of data from the ESLS um, We use structural equation modeling. We actually ended up testing different models. The reason for that was not my initial goal, but the reason for that is once we looked at all these sources of variability, so whether it was child report or teacher report, whether it was um, Spanish-speaking ELs versus Asian language ELs, once we got all the different configurations of those variables, um, it ended up being four separate models that we tested. Um, for each model, language status was an observed variable, so that's English proficient, Spanish speaking ELL, or Asian language ELL. Um, social emotional problems and academic achievement were both latent factors, um, and I talked about how those were measured earlier. The control variables were gender, socioeconomic status, previous social emotional problems in the first grade, or no, third grade, I'm thinking about my dissertation study, previous social emotional problems in third grade, and previous academic achievement in third grade as well. Um, for the data analysis, so our analyses proceeded in three steps. Um, we first established the measurement model, and across the four models, the fit indices fell within the acceptable range. So RMSEA was 0.034 to 0.04, CFI was 0.905 to 0.93. Um, again, added regression paths to build the full structural model. We tested mediation paths using the procedure I talked about earlier, so I'll go over all that again. Um, so in going through the results, I'm just going to present the visual models. I think that's kind of the easiest way to understand what's going on here. Um, so hopefully that will be kind of easy to decipher. Um, so for model one, you can see we're using child reported data. So in the circle at the top there with social emotional problems, we're using the self-description questionnaire to measure child reported social and emotional problems. And then model one is comparing on the left hand side there the observed variable of language status. We're comparing Spanish speaking ELLs to English proficient students in this model. So you can see with the model, um, Spanish speaking ELLs, um, you can see the 0.144 path estimate. They're reporting significantly more social emotional problems as compared to English proficient classmates. You can see social emotional problems are contributing to significantly lower academic achievement in the classroom. And then the direct effect from language status to academic achievement is also negative. So Spanish speaking ELs have significantly lower academic achievement than English proficient students do. Um, I also tested the significance of the indirect effect, which was statistically significant and negative, which means for Spanish speaking ELLs, they are reporting more social and emotional problems in the classroom, and this is at least partially contributing to um, their lower achievement scores that we see as compared to EP students. With model two, um, again, we're using child reported social emotional problems with the self description questionnaire. This model is comparing Asian language ELL students to EP students. Um, and you can see this model looks very different than our first one. Um, so for Asian language ELLs, there are no significant differences between Asian language ELLs and English proficient students in either social emotional problems or academic achievement. Um, the only significant path we see here is that increased social emotional problems contribute to lower academic students regardless. Um, and then the indirect effect in this model is not significant. So again, um, we see that within the difference here um, between Spanish-speaking ELLs and ELLs from Asian language backgrounds. All right, models three and four um, are moving the teacher reported social emotional problems. And you'll start to see some big differences here as well. Um, so model three, we're looking at um, social emotional problems in that variable at the top circle is being measured by the social rating scale with teacher report. And this model is compared Spanish-speaking ELLs to English proficient students. So 
So we see when using teacher reported data, teachers are reporting that Spanish speaking ELLs have significantly lower social emotional problems than their English proficient peers, which is opposite of what we found when using the child self reported data. Um, I think that's really fascinating. I think that's one of the most interesting um, findings to come out of this study. I'll talk more about that in a little bit here. Um, social emotional problems are contributing to lower academic achievement, and we see Spanish speaking ELLs have significantly lower academic achievement in this model as well. Now, where this gets really interesting and tricky, when we look at the indirect effect here, um, so the direct effect from language status to academic achievement was negative 0.208. Negative path coefficient there. When looking at the indirect effect by social emotional problems, you can see you're multiplying negative 0.047 and negative 0.359, so you're going to end up with a positive coefficient there um, for the indirect effect. Um, so, what we see the indirect effect was statistically significant, um, but it was positive. So, we have the direct and indirect effects are um, both significant but in opposite directions from each other, which is called competitive mediation. It usually indicates that there's something else going on in the model here. So we'll talk um, more about some of my thoughts about what could be going on. I'd love to hear some of your all thoughts as well. Um, model 4, we see very similar findings with Asian language ELLs. So teachers reporting that Asian language ELLs have significantly fewer social emotional concerns as compared to English proficient classmates. Social emotional problems are contributing to lower academic achievement. And in this model, um, we saw the Asian language ELLs had slightly lower academic achievement than English proficient peers. And again, we see the direct and indirect effects are in opposite directions from each other. So we're still seeing that competitive mediation pattern when using the teacher reported data. All right, I'm going to move quickly because I have like five minutes left here. Um, so findings, uh, we saw that for all the models, increased social emotional problems contribute to lower academic performance regardless of who's reporting on social emotional problems, regardless of native language background. So I think this really highlights the importance of social emotional well-being for students. The schools need to be promoting psychological well-being and mental health for all students in the classroom. Number two, I mean, again, I think this is one of the most interesting findings to come out of the study here, but results really differ when we use child reports of social emotional problems versus teacher reports. So if you'll look back to um, Spanish speaking ELLs, we saw that they reported more social emotional difficulties as compared to English proficient peers, while the teachers reported they had fewer social emotional difficulties. And for Asian language ELLs, they reported similar levels of social emotional difficulties compared to English proficient peers, where teachers again reported fewer. Um, so in both cases, we see some slight differences there, but in both cases, teachers are perceiving fewer social emotional difficulties than the ELL children themselves are actually reporting. Um, so there seems to be a bit of a mismatch there. When thinking about some potential factors that may be contributing to this, um, you know, I'm not sure if perhaps ELL students aren't communicating some of their concerns with their teachers. Perhaps they don't feel comfortable talking about their thoughts and feelings with their teachers. Perhaps teachers perceive um, these students are maybe quiet, well-behaved in class, but they assume everything is good, and they don't ask them further questions about how they're doing. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the cause of the issue is, but regardless, it seems that teachers may be unaware of some of the difficulties that are experienced by ELL kids in their class, um, which kind of brings into question, are teachers accurate reporters of social emotional well-being for ELL students? And I think that could really get at the heart of this competitive mediation pattern that we found. If we have a measure of social emotional problems um, that's inaccurately reported or inaccurately measured, perhaps is that leading to some of the conflicting findings that we're seeing in the model. So that's kind of um, my best hypothesis as of right now, although I'm still kind of mulling over some of these issues. Um, number three, we saw the results differed when considering Spanish speaking ELLs versus Asian language ELLs. So we saw that social emotional well-being mediated the relationship between language status and achievement for Spanish speaking ELLs, but this was not the case for the students from Asian language backgrounds. Um, so particularly for Spanish speaking ELLs, we want to be you know, paying particular attention to those prevention or intervention strategies in the schools. I would also highlight the importance of that with big group variability among this group of students. All right, last slide. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, I you know, keep harping how we need to promote social emotional well-being for ELL students in the schools. Well, what does that mean? How exactly do you do that? Um, research, you know, and this, this field is wide open. I think I could probably spend the rest of my career answering this question, and I might do just that. We will see. Um, but, you know, there's a variety of things to consider 
for social emotional learning program. So we've had much more popular in our schools in the um, last few years, individual and group counseling, newcomer academies for recently immigrated students, all the different formats of specialized language instruction. Do these things promote social emotional well-being for ELs? If so, how do they need to be formatted to be most efficacious for this group of students? Those are all really important questions that need to be answered. Um, number two, what's causing this mismatch between what teachers and students are perceiving in the classroom? And how can we help teachers um, perhaps get a better understanding of the experiences that ELL children are having in their classrooms? And then number three, beyond the two language groups I looked at today, again, the Spanish-speaking um, ELLs and ELs from Asian language backgrounds, how can we look at more nuanced sources of within group variability? Definitely including students from other native language backgrounds and getting large enough samples to be able to do that. But beyond native language background, what are other sources of within group variability we need to consider in our analyses and also um, at a practical level in working with students in classrooms and schools? So that's all that I have for today. I have some references, and here's my contact information. Um, I'd love to chat. If any of you are interested um, in the studies or in collaborating, please let me know. And thank you all so much for being here this morning. I appreciate it. Do we have time for questions, or should people just come up privately? One minute. <laughs> yes. students in the school as a school level control variable. So I didn't talk about all this today, but in the actual article you can see um, the you know links between that variable and all the different constructs. And I did see some differences there. For example, one that I'm remembering because I thought it was interesting is that when there was a higher percentage of ELL students in the schools, ELL students reported higher academic self-concept. So when they were surrounded by more children who were like them and who had maybe similar levels of language proficiency and experiences, um, they felt more positively about their academic skills. So that's one that's coming to mind right off my head. Um, I would have to go back and look at the study. There's a whole table in the study if you want to look at it, um, where you can see the um, relationships between the covariance and the latent constructs in the model. Um, so that, that definitely is in there. It's a good question. Yeah. Right, so looking at not just the mediators of the variable, but students' language status. Um, I, think, I think that is important. I think the one thing, I guess it's been in the back of mind if I was working on this, is we know for ELL students it takes six to eight years to gain full levels of academic proficiency in English. Um, so that may be a really long and tedious process of getting them, you know, to a full English proficiency level. And in the meantime, we can be addressing, I think, social emotional concerns while they're working on gaining some of those English skills and also hopefully maintaining their native language as well. Um, so I think that's, a, yeah, that's an important point um, that I'll probably want to address in my manuscript now that I'm thinking about it. But yeah, I think that's good. 
All right, time's up. <laughs> if you have further questions, I'm happy to um, talk with you guys up here. Hope you enjoy the rest of your time.